the upper hand here. Well, Maria, we have already seen Sean Goddard lose to Rhinos once this weekend. I think the matchup is very close, but I would give a slight edge to Kai Buddha. Both players are most likely win in whoever wins the match. And, you know, Kai's just been in this spot so many times before. That's true. That's true. All right, everybody, it's time for the best hour of Magic the Gathering coverage. Riley and Corey, I'm going to send it over to you for round number 16. Well, thanks very much, Maria. And we couldn't be more excited to be with you here from Barcelona for the final round of Swiss <laughs> at Pro Tour, the Lord of the Rings. My name's Riley Knight, and it's my great pleasure to introduce once again Corey Baumeister, my partner in crime here as we get underway with round number 16. Corey, it all comes down to this. After 16, after 15 rounds of Swiss, this 16th round will be decisive. And the destiny of these players who are fighting effectively winning in matches yes. will be ultimately determined. Kai Buda, no stranger to Sunday uh, top eight magic, of course. This would be his 11th top eight. Oh, sorry, his 12th, excuse 12th, me. 11, yes. 11 already in the books. On the other side here, we've got Sean Goddard with... Uh, Creativity and a dream. Yep, absolutely. This is the round that I think every one of us as Magic players lives for. The biggest moments on the biggest stages, seeing the biggest reactions for the biggest prize money. Let's go. We're going to get underway. Sean Goddard on the play here. Opens things up with a Bloodstained Maya and Kai Buddha as well with a land to kick things off. Of course, both players mulliganing to six. Does that favor one of the players in this matchup? Obviously, there are some decks that mulligan very well. Tron, uh, yeah. would you characterize either of these as, as... Not super effective. I would say slightly favors Sean a little bit because you do have cards like Ren and Six, and they're pretty uncounterable, especially if Sean is on the play. So Sean is able to keep two land Ren and Six and get rid of any extra lands and doesn't really need any more. But for the most part, relatively uh, even in those regards. I did enjoy uh, Sean Goddard showing the Jet Miz Garden there. You seen this card before? Grandpa, he says to <laughs> Kai Buddha. <laughs> Ever seen a land that taps for three colors, he exactly. says? Exactly. Kai Buddha's been around for basically as long as the game has, of course. For those of you who don't know, Kai Buddha is a superstar of magic. But uh, Sean Goddard is here to make his name known as well. Uh, he's, he's already got a top finish. He's won over $30,000 in prize money. Now, mm -hmm. compare that against the, half, the cool half a million that Kai has assembled and kind of pales in comparison. But let's not count Sean Goddard out. Obviously, someone who knows how to play high-pressure, high-stakes magic. Yeah, absolutely. A dominant presence in the Magic Online community, winning two showcase opens. I mean, that is so tough to do. I've played in a lot of those events, mm. and they are very tricky. So to be able to take down two of those, as well as make a mark on paper Pro Tour magic, because Sean has been doing quite well at these Pro Tours as well, um, it's going to be excellent to watch. So we can take a look at both uh, both players' hands now. And both of them look pretty good, to be honest. Uh, there's some key uh, aspects missing from Sean Goddard's hand. We don't see anything like an indomitable, indomitable creativity. But I really like Kai's hand here. Subtlety, force of negation, shardless agent as well. A lot of action here for the German yeah. juggernaut. I was going to say missing the land, but just right on cue. Misty off the top for land number three. And now I totally agree. I think the hand is great. And we're going to see, you know, to Fairy Time Reveler, like Monty was saying in the open, is the card that everything revolves around. So that's the card you're going to want to be dealing with. But another really important card is one card that Sean has in hand, and that's Spell Pierce. Spell Pierce, Spell yeah. Pierce is very good. Absolutely. The Spell Pierce uh, menace has, at, at some stages, completely dominated magic uh, in modern. One mana yeah. counter spells have been huge. Spell Snare, another one that comes to mind. Yep. And in this format at the moment, Spell Pierce can be absolutely devastating. Now... It's not going to do its best work here against Kai with that backup force of negation, but you would think Kai has to think carefully about how he wants to proceed here. Shardless Agent into two open mana is by no means a, uh, a sure thing in this yep. format. So uh, we'll see if he goes for it. He's going to crack the Misty and, uh, and go and search something up. So maybe we'll see a Shardless Agent here. And I think knowing what we know, having the bird's eye view of both hands, how does, how's this going to shake out, Corey? Well, it's just probably going to just be a Spell Pierce on the Crashing Footfall, move on to the next uh, turn. If Kai does go for it, Violent Outburst is something that you can cast on your opponent's turn, and then you can protect it with Force, because Force of Negation, of course, only protects on your opponent's turn. That's true. Force yeah. of Negation, you think, oh, great, a free counter spell. I can use this to defend my spells only yeah. on your opponent's turn. Exactly. But in this scenario here, Kai just having his hand kind of forced here... <laughs> 
pun intended, the fact that you just have two shardless agent and no uh, violent outburst, you just gotta kinda go for it and see if Sean has it. Now the one thing Kai does have next turn a little protected with this force, being able to deal with either Teferi or Creativity mm. if it's paired with a 1-1 one -one Dwarf, thanks to the fetch lands. So, Goddard has a quick look through the uh, the cards that were exiled with Cascade, and they're going to be put on the bottom in a random order. And now here's the Spell Pierce on the Crashing Footfalls. And of course, as we said, Force Negation, no good on Kai's turn. But the one thing that's pretty nice about the Shardless Agent just resolving here, there is the Lightning Bolt or the Leyline Binding to clean it up. You usually want to keep Leyline Bindings for Rhinos if they do resolve in this yeah. match. But if Shardless Agent goes unchecked, at least you could pester to fairies. Not necessarily something we're seeing uh, exactly next turn, but the 2-2 two -two body can be relevant in that regard. Yeah, that's a good point. Even though that spell pierce dealt with the crashing footfalls, the cascade is a triggered ability from the uh, agent, which is going to resolve now. The 2-2 two -two comes into play. Yep. Grey Ogres, three mana 2-2s, two not the hallmark of uh, competitive magics uh, you know not the sort of not the sort of card you often see doing a whole lot of work in competitive magic, I'm sure but I'm sure Kai has won a pro tour with a three mana two two you know, in and, his deck at and some actually, point it probably had downside yeah probably, probably had downside <laughs> yeah, to be yeah. you go back and look at some of those cards iron claw orcs absolute stinkers way back in the yeah. day creatures are a lot better than they used to be so Kai's like oh yeah get in with a three mana two two just like the old days exactly. baby. let's go it's like this this card has extra text on it I'm in so in comes Shardless Agent, of course, for two. And Goddard now thinking about whether he wants to bolt it. And he decides, yes, and get that out of here. Okay. And right now, Sean's hand is really bad. So huge advantage to Kai Buda locking up what you said, top eight, number 12. And Kai Buda on Sunday, a very scary thing for sure. So now we are going to see this crashing footfalls okay. resolve here. Was flipped somewhere, I think. We're... Uh, oh, oh, wait, no, oh, just a card oh, facing the other way. The way um, probably not too big of a deal here, but they'll get a judge just in case. This is another yeah. scenario. Call a judge yeah. whenever something uh, is needed. So th this is really interesting, right? Because obviously you have to have all of your cards well, facing the same way in your, yes. in your deck. You need to have the top of them at the top of the sleeve. Yeah. But it's a little hard. There is a top to the cards that are rotated 90 degrees, these split cards. There is a top, but it's not as immediately identifiable as some of the other cards, particularly in some of the older printings. Um, in the newer printings, that black border at the bottom is much wider with the machine-readable text. Gotcha. But I'm not sure if these are old ones or new printings, but sometimes, yeah, it's not, it's not abundantly clear. So, yep. Judge is going to come in, resolve this situation here as exactly, uh, uh, you know, as, is, is, as should be the case. Yep. No and uh, you can hear, yes, the uh, the ultimate decision there. Please try to be a bit more careful. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Not even a warning, anything like that. Just making sure it's uh, all done correctly here. We're going to cascade until we hit that crashing footfalls number two. Now, all these Rhino decks do play four of them. So just in case your opponent deals with them, we don't see them dealt with with cards like Supreme Verdict very often. It's usually one for one removal in today's day and age for modern. And that is what we're going to see from Sean. The only thing available is just one Leyline Binding to mitigate the damage here a little bit. So Sean qu uh, quickly checks out those cards that were exiled. This is an open, uh, open deckless tournament, of course, so these players do have access to uh, what's going on in each other's decks. But when all is said and done, this crashing footfall has resolved and now 10 power on the battlefield here for Kai Buddha. Quickly taken down to just six, thanks to the Leyline Binding. Okay, Archon in hand, that's kind of as much of a blank as it can be. Both players don't want to draw their namesake cards, uh, Archon or Crashing Footfalls, but it's a little bit better on Kai's side as you can just suspend it on turn one as when you seen. don't have a lot of turn one plays. As we've seen, yes, it's uh, right. it's happened in our feature match area already. Arid Mace is going to hit the bin, and Sean Goddard at this point now, I believe he can go and get a Dwarven Mine. Exactly. Dwarven Mine gets to fetch out a 1-1, one -one, which you can then target with Creativity. That's why this Creativity deck is so powerful powerful is it's a one card combo pairing with lands that are already in your deck yeah which wow. obviously this unless you're playing stifle which not many people are playing those sort of stifle effects in modern uh the one one is effectively un uncounterable you can kill it yeah but you're not being like oh i'm going to counter this spell before it comes into play because obviously yeah. you know, it's a triggered ability from a land can't respond to that he's in double creativity targeting the dwarf but 
Kaiputa has an answer in the form of Force of Negation. He's been sitting on that one for a while and yep. exiles a subtlety in order to cast the Force for free. This is happening on Sean's turn. So, of course, the free mode of Force is active. Yep. So now it's back to Kaiputa. And now that's very devastating. You know, you still have the Dwarf, so Sean is just going to need to top deck once again another creativity. Mm -hmm. But now Kai is going to have the advantage of just being able to hold up a removal spell. Creativity does need to connect, you know, in the sense that you have to have your creature live. If, uh, if you destroy the target in response, so for example, if Kai casts this uh, Fire Ice yep. uh, in response and kills the Dwarf, then it won't resolve. But look, he's taking a completely different tack. He wants this yep. game over and done with. Crashing Footfalls number three, I believe, now, yep. as we see another Shardless Agent come down. And that's just really saying to me that Kai is like, you know what, if you do get one Archon of Cruelty in play, I can it doesn't it. matter. I can you just it. sacrifice Shardless Agent, yep. Sean will go up to 14, then Ice can tap down Archon, attack for 14. 14. <laughs> wow, yep. exactly. Yep. Kai already did the math, three he's, turns in advance. He, he's figured it out. He's, yeah. he's got it all happening. And of course, in hand for Kai as well, Questing Beast, if he draws a land. So to ferry the Time Raveler, a little late to the party here. Yes. A little late to the party. This is a devastating card against Suspend decks because obviously you're not able to ca uh, cascade decks, I should say. You're not able to cascade into the card. You can't cast it because of Teferi's timing restriction rules. And uh, Goddard would be happy to see it, but it's far too late now. Yep, and right now this is one short of lethal, but thanks to that fire, it is putting Sean at negative one. Kai's going to just think, what can you have for... Uh, either red, black, or red, green. Lightning Bolt being the only thing. Kai will be able to attack first and then get the answer if needed, or just go for it now. So Fire Ice, nice and easy here to take care of both the Dwarf and Teferi. And Sean Goddard's out at that point is Kai passing through his turn without an attack. Yeah. Not a mistake he's likely to make. And so we yeah. go to game number two with Kai Buddha, the German juggernaut, back at it once again. 1-0. and oh, Just one game, Corey, from what we think is... A top eight. Yeah, it, it's looking like there's either going to be a clean cut at eight or there might be nine people and there'll be a little bit of a sweat. So definitely nothing guaranteed, but looking pretty good for these players. And look at that start on the draw, Gemstone Cavern, to be able to kind of say, you know what? Actually, I'll start. We're going to start a little yeah. earlier than you might have thought here. And uh, I want to give a shout out to all of the Magic Boomers right now that are <laughs> watching this around the world. Maybe people who grew up watching Kai and now yes. at an advanced age, sitting there, creaky need and thinking, come on, Buddha, you can get there again. Number 12. Yes. All the Magic Boomers who grew up with uh, Kai Buddha as their idol. Yeah. Are seeing him still contesting. I mean, honestly, it was slightly before my time to see him live winning all these tournaments. Yep. Mm -hmm. But once I got into Magic, you know, my my um, a lot of the people I was watching, it was great to see them well, win. But then I'd look back and watch Kai's tournaments. And, uh, you know, it's for, just really fun to watch. For us, this is yeah. like watching PV win in 20 years. Yeah. Right? Yeah. For, PV, for, Kenji. Yeah. For the Zoomers, this is like them watching Nathan Stoyer win in 40 years, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so exactly. I can certainly uh, sort yeah. of, I can certainly see how for many people around the world glued to this stream, they're wanting to see Kai get up and about here and get over the top with Sean Goddard, his only, uh, his only stumbling block, potentially, in preventing him from getting into the top eight. But we yep. know that Sean's going to give the fight of a lifetime in order to make sure that he gives himself a best chance at a, at a pro to a top eight here. All right, so Silence is a really interesting card in hand here, as well as a spell pierce. Silence is used for when Kai goes for either Shardless Agent or Violent Outburst. You need to be, okay, no problem. In response, Silence, so then you can no longer cast the card you'd Cascade into. You get the 2-2, two, two, but that's whatever. Lightning Bolt, yeah. clean that up. You can take two for a couple of turns, whatever. But yeah, Silence acts as a sort of pseudo Teferi effect, almost. Uh, or maybe it's Teferi acting as a pseudo Silence effect. Whatever. Touche. One of the ones. Touche. Uh, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. There are disruptive elements that you can bring to bear against Cascade decks like Silence that can buy you the turns. So do. this is awesome right now. Kai is all ready to deal with Spell Pierce. Exactly. He's like, I hope you have Spell Pierce because I can Mystical Dispute that back. You only have two mana available. Yep. But Silence is going to work perfectly here. Because Silence uh, costing just one mana, you cast a Mystical <laughs> Dispute. Well, you can't cast a Mystical Dispute, excuse me, against the Silence because it's white. Yeah, exactly. That's why uh, this is an excellent play. 
So this is going to uh, see, we're going to see Kai here resolve the Cascade trigger, yeah. but not resolve the Rhinos. Yeah, but can't cast it. Yeah. Sean has a quick look at these cards here. I don't know how it works. <laughs> yeah, see? And see, there you go, Kai. I'm sure exactly as to how it works. So the way that Cascade works is you may choose to cut with, without the silence in play, you may choose to cast it or not. But if you can't cast it, you can't choose to cast it. Yep. So it, basically the question is, does it stay in exile or does it go within the cards shuffled, put on the bottom? And yeah. My understanding is it will be shuffled back in. Okay. And we're going to see if the judge agrees with that assessment. Nope. Okay. Yep. So I was wrong, and the judge was uh, the judge is making a different uh, a different assessment of the situation. And you know what, Corey? That's why they're a judge, and I'm a commentator. Exactly. That would be my thing to ask. Even if you have an idea of what it is, you don't want to make a mistake. Get a get a warning or something. You know. Yeah. Oh, looks like we're changing our mind. Riley Knight once again, 1-0 <laughs> against the judge community. Here we go, baby. Let's do it. So this is why you should be in the play area. All now. right, I'm going to get down the feature okay. match area, dude. You got Perfect. the rest around by yourself. <laughs> no, we do see the uh, the crashing footfalls head into back into the library, shuffled. It's not shuffled into the library. It's shuffled yes. amongst those cards that were revealed and then put back the, towards the bottom. Yep, so, absolutely. And Kai will be happy about that. He wants as many copies of crashing footfalls in his deck as possible. Yep, 100%, just in case you ever run out of all of them. And that really can happen in Archon games. When Archon comes into play, but Kai is still trying to threaten enough damage, possibly going wide, then sometimes you really need all the crashing footfalls you can get. It comes up a lot more against, like, four-color Omnath, for instance, where they are dealing with, you know, all the creatures individually. And obviously, I just want to clarify that, obviously, I have nothing but the greatest respect for judges and the work that they do, and I appreciate the thoroughness which, with, with which they approach that... Uh, uh, questions like these, double checking to make Absolutely. sure they're going to get it right or not. Um, so I certainly hope I didn't put any noses out of joint because, again, nothing but the greatest of respect for the judges who work so tirelessly to uh, facilitate and officiate the tournaments that we love to watch so very much. I think that was a blood moon off the top here for Kai. It was a blood moon. Really interesting. Now, this is a point where Kai has to think, does this Blood Moon hurt me more than it hurts you? <laughs> a little bit, eh? And before, I mean, I guess I would say before Fable, but with through Blood Moon, you can cast Fable. And this might look a little strange. A deck that is essentially a weird, quote-unquote, mono-red because, well, creativity is red. Um, Dwarven Mind checks mountains, all those things. But the... Creativity deck cannot, by design, play any deck that does not have Mountain in its characteristic because you need all four lands to then trigger Dwarven Mine. But Blood Moon does shut off being able to get Dwarven Mine. So if you don't have creatures in play already, Blood Moon can be excellent against Creativity. Well, they, they don't even get the Dwarf if there's a, a Blood Moon out, right? That's what I'm saying, yeah. 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 You, you don't get that. It's just a Mountain. Um, and, and it gets to be a lot tougher because you can't really take it off the battlefield. But if there's already a Shaman in play plus... Reflection of Kiki Jiki is going to flip into another creativity target. It's just not very good anymore. And, and quite aside from that, if you get a, if you land a Blood Moon and your opponent draws a Teferi, they're just going to look at their mana base and think they're what, what are they going to do this? Can't exactly. Can't cast Nazorius card. Exactly. So Blood Moon surprisingly, and, and also um, another thing to note, you might be looking at the Rhinos deck and thinking, how are they how are they possibly playing Blood Moon? But that, they only need two basics. They yeah. only need the Forest and the and the Island. They don't have double-cost cards. They're not hard-casting subtlety. Exactly. And they are a red deck as well, you yeah. know? And most of the blue cards, like Force and Negation, you can just cast the Freeway. Almost all the time, that's what you're doing. The only issue is Questing Beast, and so that's why we see two Forests a lot of the time in these lists. Uh, so you can aggressively fetch for those basics uh, and still cast your, your Questy B through the Blood Moon. Yeah, and I bet that's one of the cards that, that was immediately taken out in this matchup. Not very strong. No, it, yeah. That uh, that card is almost certainly just for the one ring matchups. Now we're going to see a hard cast force of negation, <laughs> three mana negate here, and this is targeting the Ren and Six. Yep, targeting the Ren and Six, and it looks like Sean does still have that spell pierce available. So now just questioning, is it worth to cast it now? A couple things to consider. Not only it, do you maybe want to save spell pierce for a cascade spell, because Kai did not play a land last turn, you know your spell pierce could still possibly be live. Yeah. But a number two is you only have three total mana, so you could be playing right into a mystical dispute, which Kai has. Yeah, two of as yeah. well. Lorien Revealed, Blood Moon, Gemstone Caverns, and two copies of the dispute here. Yeah. And it looks like Lorien Revealed is going to be cycled away. Sure. Another key uh, addition to the modern format, thanks to the Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-earth. We've seen these 
these one mana basic land cyclers, Oliphant, Generous, uh, Generous, and Lorien Reveal, have a pretty big impact. They've yes. changed the mana bases of these Cascade decks and others quite significantly. Yep, absolutely. We do see that basic island now fetched up. This is kind of unlocking, in air quotes, uh, Blood Moon to be cast at some point. Uh -huh. Not really ideal now, but let's say this reflection of Kiki Jiki gets dealt with by some removal spell, maybe fire or something. And now the only thing that's left with is a treasure. Now maybe you do consider casting this Blood Moon and forcing the interaction from Sean. Because now Leyline Binding, it's a lot more expensive. It's still not impossible to cast, but the domain does get checked to one type. I don't think you... Oh, oh, you, oh, you can cast with the treasure, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah you yeah, cast sorry. treasure and, uh, you know, four. Five, five mountains. Four. You get one discount. Oh, you of got course. Domain. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I so guess it's still five drop. It is possible to cast it for six mana if you have, like, all wastes or something. Always. All, all non-basics. You know what? You were just saying you're going to get back into the Pro Tour game. Yeah. If you're thinking of deck building with waste, ley line binding, you're back in the booth. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm out of the booth as well. Yeah. That. All right, we've got double dwarves here. <laughs> with Dwarven Mine, and a violent outburst now from Kai. That was a tidy little rip from him. Tapping um, the having, wrong yeah, land. Miss Tapping yeah. has, to, has to tap the, uh, the Ketria Triome there in order to generate red mana. Not going to make a huge amount of difference. And Kai now pretty happy about this because he's playing around Spell Pierce, but we're going to see once again uh, the card that Kai probably didn't expect to get two of these cast against him, maybe in the whole tournament, let alone this game. Another Silence in hand for Sean. Got another copy of Silence, does he? Yep. Yep. Goodness. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Just Four copies in the board. That's incredible. Wow. Came this ready is... For this, this is just happening? Okay. With the silence in hand. Not casting it. What's the Interesting. play? Interesting. Yeah, what's the play here from Sean? Looking to just ley line binding one. Maybe our hand uh, viewer is not updated and that silence is not there? Yeah, we're not getting a great look at... Uh, so there's the ley line binding uh, to get rid of one of those rhinos. Sure, but you, you still got to deal with the other one. You could have cast... You could have spent that one mana on the silence that we think is in there. Look, well, okay. look, the game continues. Fire ice off the top here for Kai Buddha. Yeah, and with having the answer to one of these rhinos, just maybe really anticipating dealing with the next one here. Maybe it's hoping to draw a Leyline... Oh, sorry, a, a, an Indomitable Creativity and use the silence as a preemptive counter spell. That could very well be. Yep, absolutely. Use it as protection, just saying, you know what? I have plenty of draws here, let alone Teferi. Leyline Binding would both deal with the rhinos. Yeah. Teferi does something really excellent when you target a token. You can Teferi, bounce your own Leyline Binding, then recast it if you want. Um, this is interesting yeah. as well, activating the Kiki Jiki end step in order to get yep. a, a dwarf that sticks around. Yep, so just get in some extra damage. It's worth more than just attacking with Reflection of Kiki Jiki. And if you do top... Ooh, Sean really punished for not silencing by drawing third uh, silence. Ouch. Ouch. Wow, and looking at the sideboard here, Sean plays all four yeah. copies of silence. Four copies of silence in the board and the ultimate punishment here for poor old Sean drawing the second copy or the third copy in this game after he could have prevented those rhinos from coming down. He wasn't to know it. It's not... A, we, we can't be unfair to the bloke and say it was a mistake. Yep. He took a line, ultimately punished for it, but... In come the dwarves. And we're going to see fire on the reflection of Kiki Jiki. Uh -huh. So two damage. <clears throat> You're dealing with that and copying this. And this is probably at end step. Maybe Kai decided it to was, go end of second main. No, it was in, in response to the uh, the exile trigger for the token. So okay. we, we get a 1-1 one, one that sticks around for a little bit longer, but it, it's largely academic. It's, it's, it's going to prevent one damage. Exactly, yep. It'll prevent one damage. Second Blood Moon off the top. Not necessarily ideal by any means. Kai also just has Gemstone Cavern. So basically three cards that are dead. Yeah. And largely all five cards are dead because one mystical dispute in hand with this much mana already available, you can creativity for one and still pay for the one dispute. So why is he holding the Gemstone Caverns in hand? Legendary. 
Yep. The legendary with the one already in play, and oh, you would have to just get rid of it. And yep. why would you ever sacrifice the one that has the luck counter on it, I guess, when you've got that one? Yeah. Yep. You can't even tap it in response, right? You can tap it, then play another one. No, 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 but you can't, like, you can't play the non you can't, so you can't play the one without the luck counter. And it's not like Lotus Petal or something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, you can Moxander. use it as a Lotus Petal effect to, like, tap it once, play the second one if you really need one extra piece of mana. Yeah. But then, you know, you do lose the one with the luck counter on it, which is the good one. Yeah. Otherwise, you just have a waste, and you're getting closer to that waste Leyline <laughs> binding deck. Combo that we were talking about. <laughs> one day we're going to make it happen. Here's a spell pierce now on this Blood Moon. So Kai yeah. can tap two, tap two lands in order to uh, make sure that this Blood Moon resolves. Yeah, and just a little bit to tax mana. This would usually lead me to believe if I was Kai, I'd be like, okay, Sean's trying to force through creativity or Teferi next turn. So the weird mind games of it, you did it. Yeah, did it. There we go. Did it. We and saw the, uh, the that situation come to pass. Yep. Gemstone Caverns number two. We see the other one with the luck counter uh, sent to the bin because of the legend rule. And this is respecting that play. That kind of play from Sean with that confidence to spell pierce it. Yep. Really, really awesome. You know, I mean, with what's in hand, it didn't kind of make a lot of sense. But that's the whole point. It didn't make sense. And Kai's very smart. Mm. So he's going to deduce that maybe it does make sense. You know, the mind games at the highest level like this. Persist, the spicy one of in Goddard's list here, yep. is the draw, but he doesn't have anything in the bin to bring back, I don't believe. No, nothing to bring, bring back right now. Not great. It's, it's really. Not, he's not drawing well. No. He's, he's not drawing well. And just infinitely punished by not going with the silence yeah. earlier because this one of Rhino is going to do some work. Yep. Now we do have Shardless Agent where silence is going to be great. Um, but you'll still have the one extra, you definitely know? Definitely fire it off here. Oh, my yeah. goodness. I'm fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's going to be the world's fastest silence here. But now... Sean, Sean got his book, he's going to be like a bloody librarian. Yes, exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, Sean's going to be like all my elementary teachers. Yeah, yeah I bet, Corey. I bet, Corey. Please that silence. That. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you poor thing. I bet you're an absolute terror. <laughs> yeah, there it is, silence. I did nothing wrong. <laughs> my act, history will vindicate my actions. <laughs> I was a rowdy six-year-old, and I make no apology for it. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. All right, so we're going to see silence. We're going to see exactly the same play pattern as before. The uh, crashing footfalls will not be able to be cast and therefore will be shuffled back into the library uh, at the bottom uh, with, along with all those cards that were exiled to Cascade. Sean has a quick look through them. Quick squeeze at what we're working with here. And then away they go. Just taking a peek. Now at this point, when you start seeing these cards, one thing you can kind of do is start deducing a little bit what's in your opponent's hand, both with how they've been playing and with the cards you've been seeing go to the bottom. Yeah. It's still pretty tricky to full-on figure it out, but definitely not impossible. No, we saw Gabriel Nassif going through when someone cascaded yeah. off against him, and he went through and pulled all the counter spells up, all the subtleties, all the mystical disputes, all the forces of negation. It was like, right, yeah. okay, so you can only have this number. And he was making yes. notes and stuff. But the one thing is, fetch lands, reshuffle it in, and then you lose all information already. I think already, he was, think you he was just trying to figure out how many were in hand. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. but it, again, you take every scrap of information possible. Yeah, Every absolutely. scrap of information you can in situations like this. Let's see. Okay, Teferi, Time Reveler off the top. Let's see. That's we have not a bad one. It was actually, yeah, great. It's probably just going to mean that, let's see, we got, yeah, it's going to mean both disputes are going to have to be fired off. But this is fine for Kai. Uh, he will. He would cast. He'll. He'll. He'd empty his whole hand to make sure that this card doesn't enter the battlefield. So this is going to be interesting. We're probably going to see mystical dispute here. Now it'll be interesting if Sean goes for silence in response or just goes to pay for it. If you go for silence in response, maybe Kai just goes dispute right away. Because if you let silence resolve, then you can just pay for it. So, yeah. Dwarven Mine. Probably just going to be pay for -ing. That That play isn't it's necessarily it's pretty, right. It's pretty, pretty high level. Yeah. Well, well, maybe it's on a different level. It's, yeah. Whether, whether <laughs> Could it's be higher, higher or lower. Higher yeah. Level, we, don't know. we don't know. It's on a different level. We'll sure. let the people that are on the higher level uh, decide what they want to go for here. It looks like just a pay. Just a pay here. And that means that Kai is almost certainly going to reveal another mystical dispute to cast and to Fairy Time Raveler Ravels no more. Okay, and now these tokens can triple block the Shardless Agent. Misty off the top here for Kai, so he's it's a bit of a whiskey for him there. Look at this one Rhino. Yeah. It looks so innocuous so long ago. I mean, it did when Sean was at 18. Oh, sure. You know, but it has just 
Every yeah. turn, Sean's been drawing quite badly. Yes. I mean, the Teferi was a good draw, but Kai drew up enough disputes to be able to interact with one thing. So we're going to see a double block here on the Shardless Agent by the look of things. Okay, this is going to mean that's perfectly fine. Trade. Sean's going to need something right now. Right now. This Creativity. is his last chance. This is his last chance. So Kai Buddha is almost certain to lock up his 12th Pro Tour Top 8. It's not by any means guaranteed, but he is giving himself his best chance at a unbelievable 12th Pro Tour Top 8 unless Sean Goddard can come up with the goods. Let's find out what Sean is going to put in Kai's way here. Right. One like final fated draw step. So one thing that Kai can do here is play Blood Moon, and it will shut off a couple of out. It shuts down Teferi as an out. Doesn't shut down Leyline Binding, doesn't shut down Creativity, um, but still worth it more than likely. It'll just oh, minimize yep. outs by a little bit. All right, so Blood Moon the, the top of the deck for Kai Buddha, leaving up Forest Island Island over to Sean Goddard, who has to find something and has to find it right now. He draws a card in hand. Silence persist for Sean Goddard. Is this the end of the road for him? Oh, Another no! copy of Silence. Too little, too late. He brought in all four copies for the Cascade matchup. He drew all four copies, but they were not enough. Kai Buddha needs to just attack with this Rhino. And there is nothing that Sean Goddard can do. <laughs> Kai Buddha almost certainly locking up another top eight here at the Pro Tour. Oh my goodness. This guy, the German juggernaut, has been around for decades, Corey. And he is back on Magic's biggest stage more than likely. Unbelievable how you can have the level of dominance that Kai Buddha has had through his career top eight some of the digital era tournaments, you know, some of the arena events, and now top eight a paper pro tour back at it. Top eighting in every single generation of competitive magic play is so amazing. And he's looking for his, now that he's already got the 12th top eight, looking for pro tour win number eight. Number eight. Now, of course, we will wait for the <laughs> final official top eight announcement before we start getting wow. out the chisel and uh, tapping it into the... I uh, chiseled it in oh, already. He's already yeah. done it. It's already part of the Corey <laughs> Baumeister historical record. We're going to find out who will be joining our top eight as well, in addition to the players who have already got there before very much longer. Alexander Hain, Kazuna Kasaka, coming up after this.
Welcome back to Barcelona, everyone, for Pro Tour, the Lord of the Rings. We are live from Spain, Corey, and we're going to get underway with yet another piece of winning in magic. This time, we know we have got it mathematically locked up that the winner of the game that we're about to show you will be in the Pro Tour Top 8. We can't yep. wait to get to the action. We're going to get in underway now with game number three between Alexander Hain and Kazuna Kasaka. We've seen these two players before this weekend, and we've seen one of them at the very highest level in the past. Alexander Hain, he won Pro Tour Averson Restored about a decade ago. That was the first Pro Tour I ever watched, Corey. It was something really? that inspired me to take a, to take up uh, competitive magic properly. Sorry. So uh, for a while there in my mind, and sort of still a little bit today, Alexander Hain, best player in the world. Absolutely. I mean, it, it was no miracle that he won that Pro Tour, I'll tell you that. We're going to get stuck in, as I say, in game number three. Both of these players level pegging at one and one. And at 11, three and one, we are told that whoever wins this game yep. and indeed this match is a lock for the top eight. Now, of course, important to note, we are playing this at uh, at a, uh, an increased pace yep. to make sure we can get through it before the end of the broadcast. So, uh, Corey, talk us through what we're seeing here as, as a Thoughtseize opens up the account. Yeah, Thoughtseize right there taking the map. And what that does is because there is no star or sphere yet, okay. it means that uh, you, you have to cast a forest or you have to play a forest, excuse me, um, to cast Sylvan Scrying, which delays your Tron a little bit. But drawing that sphere was perfect. Now turn three Tron is inevitable. And one thing I want to touch on, the reason why these players are locked, you see the draw. Yeah. Yeah. So they will be above Kaibuta's record of X and four. Yes. Yes. So all these players are in the X3-1 bracket. They haven't picked up the fourth loss. So here, the, I mean, you never want the draw when you could get a win. Yeah. But certainly if the alternative is a loss, you'll take the draw exactly. uh, in the position like this where it puts you in into that higher echelon here. So Yeah, and uh, one other thing, Alexander Hain, one of those top finishes was in London, I believe, with Tron. You know, that was kind of yes, the yes, London yes. mulligan rule that switched over, kind of put Tron on the map, and Alexander Hain's like, you know what? It's even better now. I'm going to play it again. Yep, yep. It was. Uh, <laughs> so we, we did ask, we caught up with these players, asked them for one piece of advice for new players wanting to get into the modern format. Yeah. And Alexander Haynes' uh, piece of advice was, play Tron, it's great. Hey, can't argue with that, because well, it's looking pretty great. You can. It's been a long time villain of the modern <laughs> format. But, you know, for, for people who have been following this format for a long time, it's a, it's a familiar face in, Being, uh, in a world full of ele elemental ev evoke creatures. Being great and a villain can be mutually exclusive. You know, like, you can, you can be great and the villain. At the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. All right, so... A sphere and a relic here in the face of this Blood Moon from Kasaka. Kasaka has put Blood Moon to great effect this tournament. Against a lot of Tron players. Yes, very <laughs> true. We saw him play against Javier Dominguez, is that correct, yep, earlier on? I believe so, yep. Also on Tron. Yeah, I think Zach as well, earlier uh, yesterday. Yeah, Kasaka's done, re he's acquitted himself extremely well, playing with the biggest and the best names in the yep. biz now. Here's a grief, hard cast from the hand for four mana. Hain's going to respond with a dismember in response to the trigger, so obviously the Grief can't snag the dismember when the hand is revealed, and nothing going on in there that the Grief can have anything to do with. Reveals Tron, no action in hand, has two stored-up draw steps with the Sphere and the Relic. Uh, we'll see how fast you want to fire these off, or if you just want to protect yourself away from... Uh, other discard spells. A little interesting because if you were to top deck, like, let's say, Karn the Great Creator off that sphere, yeah. it would be excellent to play. But Alexander Hain knows this deck inside and out, so I will definitely not question it. Yeah, we'll defer to his judgment at this point as to why he's not cracking that uh, that sphere. Now, we see Douthy Voidwalker, the play here for the Rakdos Evoke player. Yeah, that is one you might have to... Uh, Sacrifice now. No, the star is the one that goes to the graveyard. Uh, Dothy Voidwalker does interact with that. If you sack the star, you can't draw a card because it never hits the graveyard. Sure. But the sphere is the other way. The sphere draws a card no matter what. Exactly. All yeah. right. So we see another sphere. Obviously, Blood Moon in so many decks is designed to punish uh, ambitious mana bases, right? If, you're, yep. if you've got a deck full of Triumphs and Shocklands, then you're going to be punished for it. But it's not Colored Mana that the Tron decks struggle with through the Blood Moon. They can make green very easily through the Chromatic cards, through the basic forests. Mm -hmm. But it does just cut them off very simply from that 1-2-7, uh, uh, three, three trick pony of the, uh, of, the of the Tron lands. Yep, absolutely. And we see probably the Spheres fired off in response to this Orgish Bowmasters. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Probably oh, all boy. of them fired off. Yeah, I think yeah. we're just going to cash in these three cards so we don't take three extra damage and amass even more army, uh, uh, an even greater army here for Kasaka. So Sphere goes away underneath the, uh, the Void Walker. And there is Karn off the top. Ooh. Decides to not crack that last one. Okay. So what can we get out of the sideboard here with okay. the Karn? Probably not the thing we're going to play immediately. It does look like I, I did see Worm Coil as well. So next turn, we're pretty likely to worm it up. But we do have Dothy Voidwalker to have that interaction where if you deal with Worm Coil Engine with a Terminate, uh, then it is destroyed. So we see Needle as well for Kosaka. Kosaka's hand is not well set up for a, uh, uh, for a Worm Coil Engine here. Pithing Needle comes down, and we'll see if we get confirmation as to exactly what that's naming. Maybe just Chromatic Sphere? It's probably Karn the Great Creator would be my guess, but you never know. All right, we'll find out. And now the uh, Kiki Chiki, or Reflection of the Mirror Breaker, I should say. Fable of the Mirror Breaker, excuse me. Yep. And we'll try to get you confirmation on that Pithing Needle target. And his Worm Coil Engine now, hard cast for just six mana. Okay, now you get two draws out of Terminate. And you're right, it was Khan Great Crater. Okay. Worm Coil Engine could be decisive here. Kasaka is not well set up to deal with it, but he's just drawn a card he seems quite excited by. It's a grief. That's a grief. Okay, not bad. You do get to get... Oh. oh, baby. Wow, another Worm Coil Engine. And this one! Exiled to the Douthy Voidwalker. It has a Void Counter on it, and it can be cast for nothing. Yes. So we'll see if you want to cast this immediately and see if you want to do some more tricks like we've been seeing earlier from Douthy Voidwalker of, let's say, Karn the Great Creator yeah. against, against Tron. It looks like the, the Voidwalker is going to get in for three here. Interesting. So now Wormcoil Engine is able to connect, and there's no way to, let's say, sacrifice a creature uh, before damage, you know, so the lifelink doesn't apply. There's no cards in hand. So if Hain wants, Hain can go up to 13. But that is a big question of if, because the crack back here is pretty large. We have 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 coming back. So Hain now cracks the Chromatic Sphere. Yep. And That's another worm. Another worm coil engine. He just doesn't stop. He just doesn't stop. So now he's going to attack with this. Whoa, 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 says Kasaka. Hang on one second, my friend. Attacks with the 6-6 six, six lifelink death touch here. If it is killed here and now, uh, it, of course, will be exiled, and therefore you won't get those worms. But Alexander Hain is thinking that with between the life gain from this worm coil engine and the next one that he can cast next turn. Yeah. Well, I think this turn, second main phase. Does he have? I don't think he's played a land yet. So he played that star oh, with course, the one no, no. floating yeah, man. No, yep. you're right. He didn't mm -hmm. because he, play, he, tapped it, he tapped the six lines last time. Bang. Bang. Worm coil engine here. Now let's see. Is there a way to top deck terminate and win? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Terminate is not quite lethal right now. Terminate, a much better answer to worm coil engine than it would be in most situations because of that Douthy void walking yes. here. Yes. Normally terminate, pretty horrific answer this to it. Fury? What have we found? Oh! It's a fury. All right. Okay. So it doesn't do a lot in a, uh, against a board of six sixes. Yeah. But very messy on <laughs> Kasuna Kasaka's side of things here. And I believe the reflection did just flip. So yeah. that is not able to copy fury. Yeah. That, but next turn, being able to just create furies here uh, is going to be quite strong. So unblockable, of course, with Shadow, the Douthy Voidwalker. But now Hain is going to line up behind two... Worm Coil Engines. Didn't see the card that he drew, Corey. It's a Karn the Great Creator, which is shut off. Yeah. And this Chromatic Star is unable to do anything. So now, as it stands, it looks like Kosaka is lining up Fury, uh, eliminate that, and another block here to just deal with both worms. And this is going to work. It's going to leave Alexander Hain with nothing. It's going to leave him with a healthy 21 life. Yeah. And Kosaka choosing to keep the uh, the void walker around here has yeah. proven to be an exceptionally good decision given yes. the fact that Alexander Hain drew so many worm coil engines if Kasaka had cashed in the the void walker for his own worm coil yeah Hain would have twice as many worms well yeah we can get frank to double check the numbers i believe uh, two worms is more than one worm yeah i believe you know, so. so i, I believe totally so totally agree with you so a very wise decision in uh, in the way that things have played out here for Kasaka. Very fortunate that things have played out the way that they have for him. He's really thinking about this block. 
Basically, there's no way to triple block here and keep one of the creatures alive yeah. by any means. It is just death touch. So you just want to put in the least amount of your own power. You're losing yeah. all the creatures that you block a worm coil with. Doesn't matter what their toughness is because of the yeah. death touch. And so now both of these are coming. <laughs> <laughs> Three worm coil engines exiled to this single Douthy Voidwalker. Did you ever have a worm collection as a kid? You know? Right. This is uh, Kazuna Kasaka digging in the garden. <laughs> get a little jar of worms to hang out with. Yep, I can see it. All right, this Douthy Voidwalker. And we're oh. going to see another copy of... Oh, oh my goodness. My. Oh, that is such an incredible play. Let us explain what has happened here. The reflection of Kiki Jiki has made a copy of the Douthy Voidwalker, which can be sacrificed to cast a card with a void counter. It, it does not yeah. have to be a card exiled by the same Voidwalker. Yes, you see the cards underneath that Voidwalker, but that's really not necessarily how it no. should accurately no, work. Not, they not should a, be in the this, exile with a counter. This is not an Oblivion Ring situation. Yes. There is not a link between that Voidwalker and the cards that it has exiled. You can see on the screen here, Choose an exiled card an opponent <laughs> owns with a void counter on it. Doesn't matter how it got the void counter. What a play from Kasaka. I did not see that one coming. I did not see that coming either. That was really awesome and almost assuredly going to lock up the win because, well, next turn, just going to do it again. Another worm coil engine for as long as that. Every time he can cast all, he can cast the chromatic spheres from underneath it if he wants. Oh, uh, Probably not doing that. Probably getting some worms. Probably getting the worm coil engines, let's be honest. But... What an incredible line from Kasaka. That was me out of the water. I know there'll be viewers around, around the world who were screaming at the screen. They saw it. They knew he was going to do it. But holy moly, blindsided me here in the booth. That was so awesome. Probably going to see it again here. You can even yeah. get Karn. Yeah. There are plenty of targets in the sideboard as well. Oh, you've seen it that before. one ring. We've seen yeah. it before. We have seen Kasaka. We've seen Rakdos Evoke players <laughs> cast the Karn, the great creator that, they're, that they've stolen off their opponents with Ragavan or whatever else. But here it comes again. Is this a Karn? He's having a look through his sideboard, thinking about it at least. Yeah, I mean, like, is Karn better than a Worm Coil? And honestly, against Karn, or against Tron, where you shut off their artifacts, yeah. I think it is. Because so, here's the, the ways that I think Kasaka could possibly either lose or not win. He's going to cast a Karn. Yeah, is with Alexander Hain having the ability to blow up Pithing Needle, play a Karn, yep. and then, like, bridge? Yes. And snaring bridge? And snaring bridge, yeah. That yeah. could change things, but it's not going to here as Kasaka plays his own Karn, <laughs> the great creator, from a with, copy Douthy Voidwalker. Which he still can't activate because of Pithing Needle, but still, it's the static. I didn't. Th that is. Yep. That's very true. And he looked through his side. He's like, "Oh, what can I get? What riches are waiting for me amongst my side boys?" Like, "Oh no, wait, I can't do that." And there is the Besaidu. So Hain had that ability. That's very considerate. Yeah. Unlocking of the opponent's card for him. Very nice of him. Cleared yep. away. Removing the pithing needle so your opponent can activate the card. So that is allowing Hain to top deck a card in the Great Creator now. Does he not have one in hand? It maybe still has one in hand. There's he, been a lot going yeah, on. Yeah, there's been a lot going uh, on the other side of the battlefield here. And that looks to me like those Terminates have been taken out. Yeah, the Terminates weren't even a live draw here for Kasaka. They were in the, they were in the board. That makes a lot of sense. It's pretty bad against Worm Coil 90% of the time. Exactly. You have to pair it with another card, and then it's still yeah. okay. And it's still just like, okay, yeah. right? It's a two-mana It's a two mana removal. Like it's just a Doom Blade at that point, yeah. All right, well, Kasaka is thinking about what he wants to get out of the board here. He's got some options, the one ring amongst them, and that's what we're going to see here for Kazuna Kasaka, picking up the mighty legendary artifact that has only just joined the modern format from the Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth. So the one thing where that looked kind of strange, why Hain besaged still in Kasaka's turn well... Kasaka could then activate Karn mm. is because when Karn came into play, wouldn't be able to use the star for green mana. So that's why he had to do it in response. Oh, of course. He couldn't yeah. sacrifice the star to make the green mana he would need to target the Karn. Yeah, so. could have untapped to use the forest, but still decided to do it now. Yep. <laughs> and Fang death on oh. Dothy to get it back oh and play goodness. another worm. Oh, my goodness. Another worm coil engine here <laughs> with the Fang death meeting that the... the, uh, the, the <laughs> There's another Douthy Voidwalker. Alexander Hain is being ripped apart limb from limb by this Rakdos Evoke deck. He does have a Khan the Great Creator. Okay. He is going to be able to go to the sideboard. Is it Ensnaring Bridge? Gotta be Bridge. It is Ensnaring Bridge. Okay. Now that's Bridge. Now let's see. What's underneath 
this now. So now the one ring cannot be activated. This is such a mess on Kazuni because he needs to clean up his bedroom because this is, oh my goodness. So that ring is in play. The cards yes. next to it are not. They are exiled with void counters on them. Everything yes. else is in play. Half those cards belong to Alexander Hain. And pretty much all those cards are bad now. It's just stars, spheres. There's no more worms. You don't even want any more worms. The one thing that Kasaka can do at any point is... <laughs> Uh, this is just going to be wild to say. Kasaka can use Karn the Great Creator to tick up on Ensnaring Bridge, and if you can find a Fury, mm. which you have Reflection now, but the Fury is gone, okay, and then so kill the Ensnaring Bridge as a creature. So the line is, uh, tick up on Ensnaring Bridge to turn it into a 3-3. Three, 3-3. Three. Three, three. Copy a Fury with a Reflection Kiki Jiggy. Or cast a Fury. Or cast a Fury. Yep. The Fury is obviously not there, but were the Fury there, that would have been the line. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Magic is just such an incredible game. And also, that being said, this is not no attackers allowed. The 1-1 one, one Orcish Army and the Bowmaster can attack down Karn and deal with it over the course of two turns. Mm -hmm. You can also Reflection to uh, copy another one of the one-power creatures. Mm, you can copy the Bowmasters, which would then mean that you can't attack with the army. You wouldn't it, be able to attack with the army, if correct. Copy, if you copy the army, it's just a 0-0, zero, zero, it dies straight away. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. So that uh, that's not an option here for, uh, we can't use the uh, the reflection. But one thing you can do, you can attack Karn for two, and then second main phase, ah, reflection, sure. Bowmaster, deal with Karn. Then you can at least draw off the one ring, and you can fetch off Karn, which off Karn, you can get engineered explosives. explosives to then blow up in Starring Bridge. All right, we found the line. We found a way to do it here. It is, this is one of the most complicated games of Magic the Gathering <laughs> I have ever seen. And I was around for the uh, the whole, uh, call, what, what, the KCI combo? Yes. Oh, my goodness me. And this is this is right up there with that. So another Undying Evil on Dothy Voidwalker to then cast something else. Goes for Sylvan Scrying. Let's see what we want to find. Goes and found, finds Mount Doom. Okay, we do have the Mount Doom legendary artifact thing right now. Is it happening? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really make really, sense. It doesn't really do anything, but, it could, but it's it would still be, cool. It would be extremely cool to chuck the One Ring into Mount Doom in this situation. <laughs> I don't know that it's going to be a game-winning play, but it is an option. Okay, is this EE, or do we want to get something else? There's Pithing Needle, Chalice, EE, the One Ring, and Unlicensed Hearse as the option. EE seems decent to me, but you don't have to do it now. The thing is with Engineered Explosives, there, is there a treasure token? Hanging around? I there guess. isn't yet. So right now it's just red black, but you do have the goblin shaman well, in can't, there. It can't attack. You're right. It can't attack. Exactly. So the engineered explosives requires a third color of mana here. Well, we've got another yeah. card in the great creator, so this is largely okay. academic now. But that was a, that was a very interesting line to explore, and that's what the, that's what's going through the, the heads of these players. And oblivion playing. stone, which can't be activated because of the opposing Karn. Okay. It's a pretty okay. normal game of modern here. And, and then the Karn on six loyalty. Karn ticked up. Yep. Looks like it didn't target anything. Yeah. Probably just tick up. So the O stone was just cast from the hand. Correct. Yeah, not yep. not not fetched from the sideboard. There, important to note. Nope. Yep. Usually just a main card that stays in. Now we see fetch lands, and they are still mountains. Remember, at least 110 years ago, Blood Moon was cast as oh, well. Oh yeah, so. you can't even chuck the one the one one ring on, into Mount Doom under the light of the Blood Moon. Ah, that's true. Boo. That's true. Boo. <laughs> So much to keep track of in this game. What a finale <laughs> to uh, a monumental struggle for these two players to try to get their, uh, their position in the top eight. Yeah, so, okay, so debating now, plenty of thinking to be doing here. Reflection on one of these Dothies. You are kind of just out of stuff to cast. You know, you can put another Worm Coil into play. Doesn't really matter. And the one piece of kind of inevitability, I would say here, for Kosaka is just reflection on Bowmaster every turn, right? And that's just a 10-turn clock, you know? Deal one, yeah. deal one, deal one, just deal one. Just a massive army that sits there, sits around doing nothing. Yeah, it's just the one damage, yeah. It's rations, but no, instead decides to go for the Dalthy Voidwalker and makes the third Worm Coil engine here. <laughs> just the third copy of Alexander Haynes. You know what? If going Worm into... Oh. What was that? Extra turns. Oh. Time has been called on the round, my friends. Time has been called. Five extra turns. Okay. What, what an extra turn does here 
What an extra turn does right now is the fact that maybe if it was going to be nine players that were going to be in contention for top eight, this would essentially eliminate both players. And it would make it so it, those eight players would be a clean cut, meaning Kai Buda being one of them would be automatically in. But a draw here is pretty much a loss. Really important thing to note here, Corey. Yeah. Because of a judge call earlier in this uh, in this game for slow play, right? Okay. We have seven extra turns, not the normal five. Seven extra turns in this game. I have. I didn't even know that was possible. Okay. All right. Well, that's what I'm being told. Seven extra turns, not five. Really important to keep that in mind as we approach the thrilling conclusion of this game here. This is just unbelievable. One of the most complicated board states I have ever seen. One of the most complicated games of Magic. And you can see Kasaka scratching his head at light speed, trying to figure out what he's going to do here. Let's remind ourselves of all the restrictions that are in play at the moment. Blood Moon, all lands and mountains, all non-basics and mountains. Neither player is able to activate the ability of artifacts, right? Because of the two copies of Khan the Great Creator. On each side, yes. Half of the <laughs> battlefield on Kasaka's side belongs to Alexander Hain. Two bird encounters from Kasaka is draining Kasaka each turn. And he can't attack because of the ensnaring bridge. Correct. A lot going on, in other words, Corey Baumeister. Welcome to modern. If you, and no one can say modern is not an exciting format. No. I will tell you that. No. This is and now incredible. And Chalice of the Void, so now we can't cast two drops. Okay, Chalice on two. Yeah. I'm getting a GRV warning just looking at this board <laughs> state, you know? <laughs> <laughs> a second Blood Moon as well has come down for Kasaka. <laughs> All these hate pieces coming together, all these cards that are making such a huge difference, but at the end of the day, that ring ticking down, don't forget, seven extra turns in this game, not the usual five. There are still three turns remaining. Okay, so this was reflection, copying, worm coil engine, add end step, sacrifice it, get two worms. Okay, just a couple more worms for the worm collection. Yep. Yep, pop them in the jar. <laughs> and Hain casts an expedition map to keep his uh, uh, keep his hand nice and empty. Tick I think, up. I think, I think you mean to put nine counters on that. Was it up to, was it six? It was on six before. GRV number one. All right, no. okay, yeah, Alexander. <laughs> well, maybe, I, did he fetch cards out of his sideboard? I'm not sure, know. honestly, I'm not. It's, this is, there is so much going on here. All right, two more damage from the one ring as we head into extra turn number six. I don't see how this game ends in one turn cycle here. I don't here. either. I don't see how this game ends. I don't think Hain can get through. Five points of damage. Well, no, because there's not another upkeep for, uh, for Kasaka. He needs seven damage. Yeah, I, I don't see how this ends right now. And all with, if that treasure was in play... You could have at least EE'd for three at some point, yep. but then the, the last car and completely locked that line yep. up that as well. That was a very short window of opportunity. Seven extra turns. Khan goes up to seven loyalty, passes the turn. We're going to see an activation, one final activation of the reflection of Kiki Jiki. And I think that's all she wrote today, sports fans, between these two players. And there's going to be a discussion between them as to what the uh, what the next uh, what the way forward is. Alexander Hain points to the one ring, saying, "You are dead to this, my friend." You are, yeah, and uh, yeah. I mean, it's just tough, such a tough spot because you know, like, if a draw, they're almost assuredly like nine tenths, you know, and that's a prize increase kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean. Who knows? This is one of those impossible situations yeah. where there's no right answer. Yeah, I don't envy either of these players exactly. here as they sit have this discussion. There will be a judge uh, standing by listening to every word because these conversations have to be very, very strictly and carefully managed yes. to avoid any, any hint of bribery, collusion, corruption, or anything like that. And both of these players will be aware of that. So this conversation yeah. will be held on a knife's edge. This was the craziest game for sure of the tournament for me. Absolutely. And one, I, one of the craziest games I've ever watched in my 10-year career. <laughs> this conversation continues here. Unreal. Are we and going to see a resolution? Kos Kosaka also like was playing really fast when it was the Dothy Voidwalker complex lines that we were seeing. So just knew the deck inside and out. But even Kosaka slowed down because like this is an unknown, uncharted territory for both players. 
You can see this conversation continues, and I can tell you what this conversation is about. Right? Okay. These players are now figuring out, right? Who would win? What would happen were this game to continue? Yeah. There are very strict rules about what you, yeah. you can't reveal cards from the top can't of your library. Cards. You can't uh, you can't talk about anything to do with. Well, there's so many things. We're not going to be able to talk about every single thing that you can and can't talk about. But let it be known that this conversation could determine and will determine exactly how this uh, this match re result uh, match I'm, result is, uh, is is determined. I'm sweating just thinking about that conversation. You know, like. So Alexander Hain here is, is is making his case about how the game would continue. The important things here, ensnaring bridge, preventing attacks, the one ring and burden counters. I also didn't even know that seven turns was a thing as well, you know, so I learned a lot this match as well. Well, let's see what's going to happen here and if this is going to come to a conclusion. Because a top eight slot is on the line. Yeah. And it is not being determined, unfortunately, by the uh, the turn of the Magic cards. It is being uh, determined by and these two players chatting and, and deciding what the way forward is. And one of the things to think about from Kasaka, yeah, the ring would probably kill him at some point. But a top deck Fury, when you can tick up Karn onto Ensnaring Bridge, you would deal with Bridge. That would force the action. That would force the uh, Oblivion Stone. If the Oblivion Stone got destroyed, all of a sudden, Kasaka gets nine worms, you know? So then advantage would be back to Kasaka. Yeah. So this yeah. is not clear and cut to me of who would actually win. All right, I can actually tell you now, yeah. we, uh, we have got a result. It is a draw between the two of them. I it is a draw between Alexander Hain yeah. and his opponent, Kazunik. Kasaka. I think that's how it had to be, because uh, there was no clear winner there. There was so many different yeah. lines, so many different things that could have happened. This is not the result that either of them would have been hoping for, but what a match we just saw, Corey. <laughs> that what was... A match. That was worth it to Barcelona all in one game right there. That was the most incredible game I've ever seen. And you can tell these players are just like, hey, you know, sorry that that happened. That's magic. That's magic. That's magic. But that, from my calculations before, it looked like it kind of clears up, you know, if 12 wins is in or not. Yeah. It, it seems like they probably are, but we'll see at the desk for sure. Well, we will find out, my friends. But that <laughs> is that for our coverage of Alexander Hayne and Kazuna Kasaka. And you can see people looking on <laughs> as this match went on. Some uh, maybe commiserations with the crew there for Kasaka. But right now, we bring it back to our, uh, by now, mostly empty tournament floor as we close out the Swiss rounds for the day, Corey. Yeah. I, I don't even know how to unpack that. That was incredible. Super fun to watch. That really, you know, is what modern is all about. Like, even these matchups where you think, yeah, if you get Blood Moon, you're probably in trouble from the Tron side. Or, yeah, if you can cast Worm Coil against this red-black deck, you know, you're going to be fine. There's games that happen like this that no one can kind of expect. Yeah. So really exciting stuff, and we get more of it tomorrow. We do indeed. Our <laughs> top eight, of course, coming your way tomorrow. I believe that we are moments away from actually announcing that top eight. I think we're going to check in with the news desk before that takes place. But uh, waiting to put the final, uh, the final touches on our broadcast for today. And I want to say... What a pleasure it's been to have you along for the ride today throughout the uh, three rounds of Limited, the five rounds of yep. Modern. Corey, it's been our pleasure to bring this broadcast to the world. We've had ups and downs and thrills and spills, and we've had board <laughs> states like that one. What a joy it's been. But for right now, my friends, we are gonna we're going to head back over to Maria at the news desk to round out day two here at Pro Tour, the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, Corey said it best there. <laughs> Brain explosion. Mani, incredible. What an incredible finish to our tournament here. That match. I, I don't know what we just witnessed. That was <laughs> unbelievably back and forth. Jeez. It 